Yeah, I'm delighted to announce uh, that we have Yoselin joining us today. She is Associate Professor at the University of Leeds. She completed her PhD in biochemistry and molecular uh, biology in Spain, followed by two postdocs in Spain and the UK. Um, she discovered a new regulatory mechanism for signaling and communication via plasma somata. She's now working on uh, working on the properties of and they used to develop new strategies for crop improvement and climate material development. Uh, she's also the coordinator of the Equality and Inclusion Faculty of Biology, uh, Biological Sciences, University of Leeds. Um, so, yeah, I think we can just jump right in. And if you want to start, Nielsen, that'd be great. Yeah, hello. Um, thank you for inviting me to give this talk. I'm going to try to share my screen. Let's see. Okay, please, please le let me know if you can see the screen. Yeah, that's perfect. Thank you. That's perfect. <laughs> okay. Um, so thank you for inviting me to give this talk. Um, as um, uh, Tani said, my name is Jocelyn Benitez Alfonso. I'm currently a lecturer and a researcher, a group leader at the University of Leeds. And today, what I want to share with you is my experience in, on overcoming barriers for effective communication in both um, in my research, as part of my research, and as part of my career pathway in academia. So if we understand communication as the action of sending and receiving information, we also understand that this is extremely important for all living organisms. And this including uh, plants, animals, humans, everyone needs communication. Those to overcome barriers for effective communication is actually one of the main ingredients to succeed and to grow not only as a person, but as a researcher, as a group leader, as an academy in academia. So we need effective ways to overcome language barriers, psychological barriers, physical barriers, uh, barriers of attitude, perception, and technology. As a mistake, the artists of this caricature actually put perception barriers twice, as you can see here. And um, I, I wonder if it actually was a mistake, because I think that perception barriers is potentially the most difficult barrier to overcome. Various people perceive the same things differently, uh, including us. And this is probably a reason why we are here, why we need to celebrate diversity in science and in research is because these um, changes in the perception between different uh, fields, between different people on, uh, on ourselves. So by the end of this seminar, I will tell you how I as individual, from coming from very modest background from Cuba, have overcome these communication barriers. And I will establish uh, or try to establish parallelisms with plant cells. Let's see how this is going. So as, as you can imagine, for plants, communication is extremely important. Plants are remain grounded during their lifetime in the same space. Therefore, uh, communication of the environmental signals, communication of their physiological status, of the soil conditions is essential for coordinating plant growth and coordinate their responses to the environment. Here you can see a tobacco plant, and uh, if we illuminate this tobacco plant on the UV light, we can see uh, the tobacco plant just in red due to the chlorophyll. In this case, we have followed the growth of this tobacco plant and infiltrated in this source leaf with a signal in the form of, of, of a fluorescent signal. This fluorescent uh, signal, let's look at it again basically move cell to cell and into the vascular tissue to invade the new tissue, the new leaf that is forming. Just a simplifying communication in plant cells. How plants do that? And more intriguingly, when they are, plant cells are surrounded by really strong barriers for these communications in the form of cell walls. This is a question that uh, several researchers are trying to, to figure out. 
And in the case of, of this plan and this specific signal, which is actually a virus, we know that uh, these uh, barriers uh, or plant cells are overcoming this barrier by targeting a specific microdomains within these plant cell walls. These microdomains allow the virus or the signal to move from one cell into the neighboring cell, facilitating in that way the communication of this signal across the whole plant body. If we look more closely, closely to these microchannels, this, uh, can, we can see this type of structures. These structures are traversing the cell wall, are named plasmodesmata, and allow not only the transport of uh, small molecules, but also of large molecules such as protein and viruses. Plasmodesmata uh, are uh, strongly regulated throughout development and their function is essential for many biological processes such as flowering. Uh, proteins such as uh, the flowering locus T has been shown to move in response to, to light and temperature from leaf into the uh, shoot merry stem to induce uh, flowering. And this has been shown to be facilitated by a uh, transport through these channels, uh, plasmodesmata channels. On the other hand, uh, plasmodesmata mutants has been shown to have a different response to pathogens. Uh, in these cases, uh, uh, the pathogen botrytis cinerea in, in Arabidopsis uh, plants. And we can see here the plasmodesmata mutant with a much enhanced infection site uh, of the pathogen, suggesting that plasmodesmata regulation is essential for developmental and environmental responses. Thus, of course, we are really intrigued about these instructors because um, not only because of the, of, of the need for us to understand how plant cells communicate, but also because by targeting these structures, we can improve plant growth and environmental resilience. We can start to uh, produce healthier crops, uh, improving agriculture, um, but also generating materials as form of biomaterials and natural products. Those uh, from plants, as you know, are really key for sustainability and for better ecological systems. Thus, understanding how plant cells communicate and move these signals and how they coordinate their growth and their development in response to this communication is a key question in plant biology. In terms of uh, applications of this knowledge, as you very well know, uh, we are facing really uh, strong challenges in the near future with a uh, population growth expected to be for more than 2 million, uh, which contribute to a reduction in, or, or, or lack of food security and also an increase in the amount of waste material of products that we are using, including plastics. This is exacerbated by the effect of the global warming, um, which basically a, a kind of a post real, real challenges into uh, growing crops and uh, generating the food that we need to maintain this uh, growth in, in population. Thus, um, for a while now, since uh, my postdoctoral research, has, I have been looking uh, as, at these structures as targets, as novel targets for potentially uh, crop improvement. From uh, genetics and proteomics to molecular biology tools to uh, biochemical screenings, we have tried to um, over, uh, overlook uh, what regulate the structures around plasmodesmata and the transport through these channels. Um, almost everywhere we have come up with the same uh, mechanisms. A, a strong regulation by cell walls that um, limit the plasmodesmata sites and specifically on the accumulation of this polysaccharide named here callos. Callos is a polymer very similar to cellulose that accumulates in cell walls around plasmodesmata. And it's believed that the accumulation of, of callos basically reduce the size of these channels, limiting the transport of molecules through the channel. 
There has been uh, already discovered by us and by other groups, callosynthases and beta-glucanases, which are enzymes that mediate the synthesis and degradation of callos, and therefore controlling the size of these channels and the transport through them. You can see here a beta-glucanase identified uh, in, in my lab, in which you can see that they accumulate in a specific locations around the cell wall. This is the beta-glucanase labeled with a fluorescent tag. And these accumulations coincide with the regions in which callos are deposited. And this in here, callos is revealed by the uh, dye aniline blue. If we use callos synthesis by, uh, to induce callos deposition, we can see that we can have a real effect. Here is aniline blue again in a, in a cell wall. And by inducing the callos synthase 3 a, a, a activated version of callos, we can see that there is more, more of this dye, suggesting that there is more higher callos accumulation. Okay, so before I show you a, a picture of or, or a video of a tobacco plant infected with a virus in one of the uh, of the source leaf, and I show you how that um, a fluorescent virus is able to move from the source leaf into the new tissue. Well, by targeting callos, we are able to modify the movement of these signals. Here, uh, there are two mutants in a glucanase, which is a callose degrading enzyme. Those uh, uh, muta mutations on, on this enzyme lead to higher callose accumulation. And as you see here, there is a restriction in the transport of this fluorescent signal, which is GFP, into the neighboring cells. And this is very much restricted in comparison to the wild type. When we look at viruses infection, you can see that indeed this uh, specific beta-glucanase was associated with a reduction in the infection site area, whereas other beta-glucanases that are not uh, linked to plasmodesmata are uh, just not able to do the same effect. Thus, a regulation of plasmodesmata callos by this specific beta-1,3 glucanase is able to restrict uh, viruses infection. Unfortunately, inducing callos is not always beneficial. We could see in these plants in which we uh, topically uh, increase callos deposition uh, using a mutant in an enzyme that regulates callos uh, uh, biosynthesis. We modify plasmodesmata. This is the wild type and this is the mutant plasmodesmata. You can see here that is uh, much more um, uh, constricted. But what we what we get then is a reduction in the in the growth of this mutant of these plants. These mutants basically grow very small and die rapidly after germination. Better effects are um, are achieved when we modify callos specifically in a, a, a cell type. In this case, we use beta-1,3 glucanases that are specifically expressed in the vascular tissue of the roots of Arabidopsis uh, plants. And uh, by, in, by mutating these beta-glucanases, again, we produce an induction in the amount of callos revealed here with aniline blue, and a reduction in the transport of GFP. Here is the wild type, here is the mutant GFP transport. And fortunately, in this case, by doing these modifications in callos, specifically in the flow and pole pericycle, so in the vascular tissue of this plant, we can get very good phenotypes. So we get longer roots in, uh, in, in nutrient deficient uh, uh, conditions and the formation of uh, more lateral roots, which improve nutrient uptake and water uptake. Thus, we can get both. We can get by modifying callos, we can get positive and negative effects on um, um, plant development. Our most recent work concerns the development of uh, nitrogen fixing nodules. Um, as uh, this, this 
it's a collaboration that we started some uh, time ago uh, with the group of Fernanda Carvalho de Nivel in, 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 in France. And we were looking at what is the effect of plasmodesmata on the regulation of the nitrogen fixing uh, uh, symbiosis. As you probably know, biological nitrogen fixation is key for sustainable agriculture. So legumes are uh, plants that fix nitrogen, atmospheric nitrogens in specific organelles named nodules where they host nitrogen fixing bacteria. This not only benefit the legumes, which um, uh, grow much better after nitrogen fixation in depleted soils, but also improve the nutritional value of this legume, as well as add as fertilizers for uh, nutrient depleted soils in which uh, by using these crop residues, we can grow um, uh, food crops such as uh, cereals. Thus, looking at these mechanisms is really key for uh, finding a strat new strategies to, to sustainable uh, agriculture. So we use uh, Medicago truncatula legume plants, which are a model plant, and um, uh, use their um, uh, interaction with rhizobia and look at the formation of uh, nitrogen-fixing organs uh, named nodules. And by looking at this interaction, we could identify beta-1,3 glucanases enzymes that are um, uh, involved in the formation of these nodules. Uh, topically, expressing these beta-1,3 glucanase enzymes lead to really um, cool phenotypes. As you can see here, we can see an induction in the number of nodules that can be much more uh, nicely pictured here uh, in, in this route in the right, on the right. And uh, uh, this, although it's not yet um, uh, confirmed, uh, com uh, uh, could lead to higher nitrogen uh, fixation. On the contrary, when we induce callos synthesis, which uh, means that we induce callos in the, in the same domains in which this beta-1,3 glucanase is expressed, we could see that there is a decrease in the number of nodules and also a decrease in the infection of these nodules with the nitrogen-fixing bacteria, suggesting that decreasing plasmodesmata in this case by increasing calos does not benefit the, benefit the symbiotic processes. So with these few examples, I just want to um, uh, take home message that the regulation of plasmodesmata communication is very important for plant development and for responses to the environment. The changing calos by targeting uh, calosynthases and beta-1,3 glucanases, which has the synthesis synthetic and degrading enzymes can lead to desirable and undesirable phenotypes. And these modifications are highly, uh, the effect of this modification are highly dependent on the tissue in which callus is, is modified. So as, as I showed you before, if we modify callus everywhere, we can get, uh, by increasing callos, we get this very small phenotype, whereas if we do it specifically in the pericycle, we can get longer roots and more lateral roots. So how, basically, this a, a, a polysaccharide that is just a, 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 a sugar, a component of the cell wall, is able to control that finally the effect that has on plasmodesmata communication and on plant development. So can we understand more about the effects of callos and plasmodesmata? And can we use this knowledge to predict how plants are gonna react or how plants are gonna adapt to changes in the environment? It's very difficult to answer this question by looking at plant cells because um, plasmodesmata are embedded in cell walls and therefore it's very difficult to identify one cell from the other and what callos does in one cell type in comparison to other. So we actually look and in relation moreover with other transport mechanisms. 
So we look at developing uh, mathematical models, and this is another collaboration. This is a collaboration with mathematicians Eva Dainen and Bella Mulder, which was uh, uh, published last year in eLife. And we look at plasmodesmata, they are micrograph, they are structure. And uh, what Eva did was model or create equations to model uh, the plasmodesmata structural features, including their neck radius and their central cavity. And then also include in these models other uh, considerations such as the flow towards these channels and the connectivity between different cells. The general belief in terms of plasmodesmata is that increasing calos lead to reductions in plasmodesmata aperture, that reduction in the radius of the neck region, and therefore that reduction is really the main cause of reduced transport through the channel. Thus, we wanted to test uh, this hypothesis and compare basically the flow or the molecular flow through channels with different radius by looking at the molar flow rate and the particle resident time. Here you can see that in these cell walls of, of, of this thick thickness of 100 nanometers, we could then see that there was higher dependence with the radius. So basically the increases in radius rapidly saturate the capacity of increased radio and increased molar flow rate very rapidly saturate. So increasing radio over these 18 uh, nanometers are not any longer much better for transport through the channel. This completely changed when we double the cell wall thickness. So in thicker cell walls, then the dependence to the radius of the plasmodesmata is much higher, suggesting that actually in thicker cell walls, the accumulation of calos, the reduction of radius might have a bigger effect in the flow to the channel, here shown in red. So in summary, or in, in brief, uh, part of this study, and I, 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 I encourage you to look at the full articles, we suggest uh, we look at different structural features, but part of this study showed that the, first, the effect of uh, plasmodesmata radius on transport depends highly on how thick the cell wall is. And this is basically a feature of which cell type we are looking at. To summarize this part of the talk, so we not only know now that plasmodesmata are important for communication and for plant development, we also know that the effect of calos is highly dependent on what tissue and organ or plant condition uh, we are looking at. And now by using molecular models, we can justify also the fact that the effects of changes in plasmodesmata radius driven potentially by calos depend on cell wall thickness. So if this in, 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 in thin cell walls, the effect of radius is not that important. We also interacted with physicists to look at also at the, at the, at the properties of this uh, callous uh, molecule in cell walls. Again, by using, in this case, physical models, what we did is creating mixtures of uh, off-the-shelf both callous and cellulose and to explore the properties of this mixture, the mechanical properties of this mixture, to understand how calos can restrict transport through the channel. These mixtures of this polysaccharide were made in ionic liquid, which is basically a, a solvent for this type of polysaccharides. And one of our first uh, surprise was when we look at these mixtures on their NMR. And then we see that basically the properties of cellulose change with the concentration of calos, as expected. But these changes were not linearly correlated. So more calos doesn't mean, doesn't mean that there is more diffusion in this case, which is the, the, the properties that we are looking here. 
but there are some irregularities in this pattern, suggesting that callos and cellulose interact at a specific at certain concentrations. To look more further into what is the effect of these interactions between callosos and cellulose into the mechanical properties of the cell wall, we uh, approach this by creating hydrogels. We basically reprecipitated the polymers from the ionic liquid solution using water to create this uh, type of gels that we can now test mechanically using uh, different techniques. Our main hypothesis was that callos basically kind of stiffen these walls. So although um, it can or it cannot change the radius, for sure what it change is the transport through the channel by don't allowing the flexibility of the channel to, uh, to accommodate for the transport of large molecules. And that was our initial hypothesis, uh, which was basically rejected. We tested with FM nano indentation and a textural analyzer to identify the changes in the stiffness and the plasticity of these uh, hydrogels. And to our surprise, we see that when increasing calos, the stiffness of this hydrogel reduce, kind of contradicting our initial hypothesis that uh, stiffer or more rigid cell walls uh, due to increases in calos restrict uh, transport through the channel. Those, um, this new uh, evidence or this new uh, assay basically suggests that the mechanical properties of calos and their role in regulating the transport to the channel depend on interaction with cellulose, which again posed the question if this was related with cell wall composition. As I said before, cell wall composition is changing between different cells, and we already have seen that, that the fat of callos is highly dependent on which tissue, organ, or plant uh, condition we are uh, presented. We also show that this is highly dependent on cell wall sickness. So the fat of callos depends on how sick is the cell wall that we are looking at by mathematical modeling. And now we add the fact that the mechanical properties of callos are also modified by cellulose. When I, in the, when I think about cell wall composition, um, I'm not thinking only about cellulose. When we look closely at plasmodesmata, we can see, and these are immunolocalization used with antibodies against different colors, uh, different cell wall polysaccharides. And we can see that in these structures, there is not only callos, which is here um, a stain in green, but there are also accumulation of other types of cell wall polysaccharides. In this case, I'm showing as an example on esterified pectins, which don't directly co-localize with callos, but actually surround the regions in which callos is, uh, is, is, is acting. How these other polysaccharides are affecting the, the properties of callos is topic for a completely uh, different uh, seminar. And we don't really have the full answer to that question. We also know that when we modify callos by inducing callos with callos synthesis or reducing callos by using callos degrading enzyme, beta-1,3 glucanases, we not only lead to changes in callos, but to lead to changes to another cell wall polysaccharide. In this case, are shown as an example, siloglucans. We can see that increasing callos increase highly the amount of siloglucans that are detected using antibodies against this specific polysaccharide. The cell walls change when callos change. Therefore, we cannot interpret the properties of callos by looking only at the um, uh, by the by looking only at callos alone. But we need to actually identify these properties within the context of the cell wall in which they are embedded. 
All these studies, what it shows very clearly, is that we still have a lot to learn about plasmodesmata. We need to understand all the aspects that control their regulation. And only then is when we are going to be able to use it as targets for uh, crop biotechnology or even as uh, uh, sources of uh, strategies or initiative to create new biomaterials that could substitute bioplastics. And this can be only done by mixing different uh, fields. I have shown you evidences of interactions or, or how we can use uh, mathematical models into understanding or dissecting the questions on the role of plasmodesmata in cell-to-cell -cell communication. I have also shown you how we can use uh, polymer physics and material sciences into uh, looking at the properties of cell walls and therefore identifying the critical factors that biologically modify the channel up. Those cross disciplines are essential in every piece of the work that we are doing. And uh, talking about cross discipline uh, approaches, um, uh, recently we have established uh, collaborations with another group, the group of Ika Hilariota and Mark Bourdon in Cambridge, uh, where we're going to where we're starting to investigate the effects of increasing calos on wood. So uh, in this case, it's popular and lines has been generated with high calos content. And we are looking now at what are the properties of these cell walls and how they could be used, this uh, cellulose structure from this uh, material, how can be used as a source of novel biomaterials or even as a source of new biofuels. So as, as, as you see, my, my work expands not only the topics of biology, but it goes towards uh, biophysics and uh, uh, material sciences. And uh, how I got here, I guess that is the question. Well, I come from a, a, a very small country, Cuba. Um, I study at the University of La Habana. I study chemistry. And from Cuba, I uh, moved to the University of Cordoba, Spain, where I started working uh, with plants. I did my PhD in Spain, in Spain uh, working with olive tree. And after my PhD, I moved to Cold Spring Harbor in New York uh, to continue my studies, um, um, my postdoctoral research, this time focusing on plasmodesmata communication. From the United States, I moved back now to England, where I continue working on plasmodesmata using proteomic screen in the Young Innes Center in Norwich. And from there, I got uh, my uh, current position in, at the University of Leeds, starting as a lecturer and uh, now moving uh, towards um, um, associate professor. So what these places have given me is not only a look at um, different uh, cultures, uh, different uh, way of workings, different technologies, but what has opened to me is a huge um, network of collaborations. And if I would say something that has helped me to overcome these barriers for communication, our collaboration. Collaboration is key for everything that I do and is key for the way in which um, uh, I am perceived by uh, the research or by the scientific community. So collaboration has allowed me to actually kind of break language barriers, psychological barriers, physical barriers, barriers of attitudes and perception by the whole community. And uh, if, if something kind of come from me in terms of the, at the personal level, is that we should exploit more these uh, uh, ways of collaboration to actually get and embrace uh, a, a new, new ways and new uh, ways to looking at questions in biology, in conservation, in biodiversity, so that we can get more a step forward towards um, uh, solving these questions. So with that, I want to just uh, thank the people that really did the work and my collaborators, which uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, are many. Um, 
I want to 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 thank a, a lot of the the fund the funders. The Liber Hume Trust has has been really instrumental for the work that I have described here, as well as well as EPSRC and and other uh, funders. Uh, from my lab, uh, uh, Candela Spaniagua, Lian German, Philip Kirk, Hendrik, Luisa, and a uh, newly um, a student, uh, Emily, and other past uh, members, Sam Asbury, Mercedes, Radwa, Rocio, and uh, Rudwin, uh, are people that I need to thank very much for uh, all the time and the patience that they have with dealing with me. Um, my collaborators, as I say, are from many different areas. Uh, I have mentioned Ika Hilariuta, Matt Bourdon. Um, I have to mention Emmanuel Bayer and Fernanda de Carvalho Nivel, Fritz uh, Kragel, and Paul Knotts. Uh, these are more from the biological side, but we, I have a lot of collaboration in physics uh, with Mike Rees, Tatiana Butova, Simon Connell, in math with Veronica Grinison, Eva Dynan, and Bella. Uh, Mulder with companies such as uh, Futamura. So basically a huge, uh, and this is not uh, a exhaustive list of collaborators. Please connect to me with me uh, through Twitter at Benitez Alfonso Lab, and also visit uh, our webpage uh, in WordPress. And with that, I'm inviting you to, to the next uh, intercellular communication and plasma desmata meeting, which will be hopefully celebrated in St. Andrews next year. Uh, I want to thank you all for, my atten for your attention and happy to answer any questions. And that's it for me now. <laughs> I cannot hear you, unfortunately. <laughs> okay. I think now. Right. So, yes, thank you, Yoslin, for um, your really fascinating talk. And thank you to everyone else who um, stuck around and, you know, moved over to this. Um, so we have had a few questions uh, in. First of all, I'd just like to say that that was a um, really good point about um, the collaborations that you have to have with lots of other people as well. Um, you know, you mentioned mathematicians and um, mm. and all of that collaboration with everyone is really, really cool. Um, and I hope we can see more of that in the future as well and that people start to branch out a little bit and really talk to each other. Um, so, yeah, so we have had a few questions in. So someone's asked, where is your research uh, taking you next? Do you have any ideas? Yeah, so um, can you hear me well or no? Yes? <laughs> now I'm scared that I'm never gonna be heard. <laughs> Communication, it seems to be you know, my fault. Yeah. <laughs> so um, yes, the research at the moment is taking me into, um, um, into all these areas that I, I have a kind of portrayed here. So by looking at cell walls around plasmodesmata, we have a starting just to um, start to define what are the key ingredients that change the transport through the channel. And now we don't only believe there is Kalos alone, I think that Kalos uh, play a role, a very important role, but this role is modified by other cell wall polysaccharides. And our next question is to look what this other cell wall polysaccharides besides cellulose is doing to Kalos. And can we actually uh, test this into a real mm, plant system? Because at the moment, uh, to answer this question, we have been using physical models. So just um, uh, um, uh, this um, hydrogels approach, but uh, we really very much would like to actually modify these polysaccharides in plants and then see when we modify calos, which interactions can we dissect, how that change cell wall mechanical properties, how that really change communication. And those are the directions that I am taking uh, uh, at the moment, looking uh, more at the mechanism, because I think that without this mechanistic understanding, we will be far away from actually finding tools to modify and to benefit from the modifications of plasma desmata. Cool. That's, that sounds great. Um, so, and we've had another question, which is, does modifying callose concentrations within cells 
affect the immune response of plants? Yes. Um, so there is a huge uh, area of research in plant responses to pathogens. Of course, as, uh, <laughs> as many pathogens, many different responses, <laughs> as diversity of pathogens, diversity of, 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 of responses. Um, there are uh, insights into immune responses uh, affected by plasmodesmata. I, um, I cannot say that is directly or indirectly due to callos deposition. Um, we know that there are receptor-like kinases that are uh, located at plasmodesmata and that perceive these uh, pathogen responses, uh, pathogens attack and uh, trigger signaling pathways that modify the signaling uh, between uh, cells. We cannot say that this is um, specifically due to changes in calos. Calos might be a trigger for um, non incompatible responses uh, that lead to basically cell isolation and cell death. It might not be the trigger for uh, um, uh, transmitting the signal. Okay, thank you. Um, so we've got a couple more that we'll before we finish. Um, how would the introduction of differing um, amounts of callus in tissue improve plants for fossil fuels? Plant. Uh, I'm sorry, you got caught in the middle. <laughs> how they one? How would the introduction of differing amounts of callus in tissue improve plants for fossil fuels? Okay, so for biofuels, so <laughs> this is, um, um, okay, maybe, I, so it's, it's a still a work in progress and I cannot reveal completely what the outcome is because it's not exactly my work, but um, yes, callous interaction with cellulose, as you can imagine, lead uh, to different um, organization of cellulose, different crystallinity in the cellulose and different interaction of cellulose with other polysaccharides. Those di uh, digestion of cell walls in the form of saccharification, which is what leads to the, to the production of ethanol in bi and biofuels, um, is very much changed with the changes in callos. And this is obvious just by thinking about the interaction between callos and cellulose, but also between callos, between cellulose and other cell wall polysaccharides in the cell wall. Those, um, again, is very uh, preliminary information at the moment, uh, but we think that there is a route there to improve uh, saccharification and improve in that way um, the, the production of biofuels from plant cell walls. Cool, amazing. Um, okay, so we've got maybe one more. Um, will the ability to modify the flexibility of plasmatismata convey any positive attributes to crop plants under future climate changes? Yes, um, as I say, this, this question is quite kind of complicated. Yes, um, we can modify plasmodesmata. And at this point, we know that when we do that, as, as I show, we can get very diverse responses and very diverse changes. Um, it is um, uh, important for um, the transport of molecules that lead to developmental phenotypes, such as the growth of roots, the growth of meristem to produce flowers, but it's also important for the interaction between plant cells and pathogens. Thus, the important question here is, yes, we could do this, if we are able to modify in a specific way. The thing is at the moment, we don't have the tools or the knowledge to target plasmodesmata specifically in a specific cell type and against a specific um, um, in trigger, you know, against, uh, for example, um, against um, a, a, a detection of a specific pathogen. So we want to, to 
to learn more. We need to learn more. We need to do more discovery science <laughs> to actually learn more about these structures before we actually can design strategies that will lead us to improvement of crops and their resilience to climate change. But we are on our way, and I mean, I, I hope that 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 a lot of you kind of join me into into this adventure because I think that these channels um, holds a lot of. Um, secrets that are now exploited and that 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 we have the opportunity now to start uh, learning with the new technologies to learn about them and to exploit it for our benefits cool that sounds like a really interesting direction for future research then as well um so yeah. we're gonna have to wrap up there i'm sorry if um you if the people watching can't hear me i'm hoping the captions are doing a good enough job um, I wasn't <laughs> expecting to have to live stream last minute. Um, so once again, thank you everybody who stuck around and um, was okay with that technical difficulty that we came across. That was the first of the Biodiverse Festival and hopefully the last. And thank you again, Yoselin, for joining us. Uh, today. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. This is a wonderful opportunity to, to expose the science as well of a diverse community. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, that was yeah really interesting area of research as well. Um, so just before we finish, we will put up the recorded version of this, which is why we did record, um, onto YouTube as soon as we are able. So if you didn't catch everything, you can go back um, hopefully tomorrow and be able to watch uh, the full recording um, without any of the technical glitches that we had. Um, so I think we're going to end there. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. And thank you again, Yoselin, as well. Um, so I will end this now. <laughs> OK, bye.